Father, we thank you once more for your mercies made new every day, for your great love towards us. As we contemplate the third temptation now, may we understand the victory that Jesus had, how powerful it is, how all-encompassing it is, how nothing can turn it around. Help us to see what it means to us in our own lives. Help us to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we've all heard it three times and you're out. <laughs> and we're going to see probably where that came from. <laughs> three times and you're out. <laughs> Jesus had shown that bread is secondary. Okay, that's secondary. All our material needs <laughs> are secondary. Then he showed that trust, real trust, makes no experiments. Okay? No testing. You just trust. And of course, the what he was doing was what most of the churches don't recognize. He was not demonstrating what his body could do and then what his spirit could do. That's the way they all talk about this. He was demonstrating what a whole man does. <laughs> See? Yeah, what a whole man. And we shouldn't forget that when we talk to people because they're, they're thinking there's two different things happening here. That's why there were two temptations. No, it was one man doing both of them. And he's going to do the third one now. Well, the devil is getting a little bit exasperated now. He has never in all of his experience met something like this. <laughs> he fooled the angels in heaven, those pure, holy beings. <laughs> and he's in front of another pure, holy being, and he figured, I'll get this one too. <laughs> and so he's trying to figure this out. He said, now, wait a minute. We went after... What men fail every time. I've never missed a man on the first one. He got past that one. We, he got past the scriptures that I quoted a good scripture. He saw through it. And he knows that real faith doesn't do what I said. What am I going to do with him? He's a perfect human. <laughs> He's finally figured it. <laughs> he is a perfect human. I cannot attack him on his personality. It holds. No matter what direction I go, it's going to hold. What can I do with him? So, once he got it figured out, he said, I know what to do. I will somehow make it impossible for him to finish his mission. I'll go after his work. <laughs> He's a perfect human. I've got to trip him up in the work somehow, his mission. So that's what we're looking at in the third temptation. The devil is going to somehow put an obstacle in the way so Jesus can't finish it, can't complete it. You know, he really... He really has to do it this way. Because Jesus has just gone through 30 years of perfection. <laughs> I don't know how some people miss that. <laughs> 30 years of perfection. 40 days of suffering like no human has really gone through because they all die. <laughs> And two attacks. <laughs> smart, smart, subtle attacks. And so, he's going to aim now for perfect service. He's going to do something with that perfect service. He comes out in the open. 
because there's nothing to hide anymore. Jesus knows exactly who he is. <laughs> he knows Jesus has spotted him, so he says, okay, <laughs> off with the disguise. <laughs> We're going to do battle now. <laughs> I can't ruin the man. The baptism was just a few days ago. God said that's his son. Jesus identified himself with the transgressors. He said, I am one of you to take your place. And of course, following that all the way through, that means death. You all deserve to die. I will die. And the devil saw that. He doesn't know a lot of things yet, but he saw that's where this goes. It's clear to death. You know, the devil doesn't have a complete picture. We have to understand. He knew what the Bible said, the Old Testament. And he sees Jesus in front of him and he sees the perfection but he hasn't got it put together yet. He's still working on it. There's a blind side to Satan. There's, there are a few things he doesn't know yet. He's working on it, and he's very fast. <laughs> he doesn't recognize something very important. That victory, perfect victory from a perfect servant comes out perfect service. He doesn't know that. That's why he went to the place where he went. He's going to attack the service and he doesn't know. Jesus has already had perfect victory two times. All he can do now is have perfect service. Loyalty. And so the devil is going to test him on this point because he thinks this is the place I can get in. And so Matthew 4, 8, it says again, the devil had taken him up into an exceeding high mountain. Now, we're not going to get into a discussion of how he did that. I mean, that's an amazing thing. The devil gets to take Jesus here and take him there. We don't need to get into it. We don't have enough to work with. <laughs> the fact is he took him. Now, I want you to remember that because if the devil has the power to do that to Jesus, think what he can do with you and me. <laughs> he could do that with Jesus. That's all I'm going to say about that side of it. He took him up to this high mountain. He took him up there so he could look down on everything, see. And the King James says, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. We'll stop there for now. We don't know exactly what he did with Jesus. Somehow, he put something in front of him to look at. <laughs> Alan White says, a panorama. Well, that's a little better to work with. We can almost visualize a panorama. <laughs> but we still don't have a lot. What was it? Was it 3D? <laughs> was it? <laughs> Whatever it was, it was spectacular. He didn't mess around. Hollywood has never done anything like it. <laughs> yeah, he showed him glory. <laughs> He showed him populations. He showed him science. He showed him art. He showed him technology. It was dazzling. It was dazzling. All that he could come up with in this world. There's a couple words left out of here. We're told in another gospel that the devil did this in a moment. We need that little detail. See, in a moment. Oh, oh.
He showed him what? Egypt. We're still marveling at the things they had in Egypt. They had more gold then than we've ever even found since then. <laughs> yeah. Greece. Rome. Maybe the United States before we came here. The Indians. The Peruvians. The Incas. The we don't know what the devil showed him exactly, but whatever it was, he thought it was pretty good. <laughs> the kingdom. And you know, when he gets to uh, verse 9, he says, um, all these things, all of this wonder, I will give thee. if you will fall down and worship me. And he meant, you know, just one time, that's all. Just bow down one time, and it's all yours. <laughs> and there's something really subtle going on here because there are lots of things he didn't say that Jesus would have known right away. And the devil knew that. Jesus will pick up what I'm really saying here. He knew who he was dealing with by now. Well, now, this gorgeous spectacle, China, Japan, you know, all these worlds have something to, to show. <laughs> We're still finding things. He says, all this, I will give you kingdoms, all these kingdoms. Now, why could he say, I will give them to you? Did he own them? Well, think about that for a minute. Because the King James is doing something here that we may not have understood. In the Revelation, it happens again. The word King James people use is kingdoms. Now, when it is said that way, it is a true statement that they belong to Satan because... They are all evil because he inspired them. <laughs> so there's kind of something behind him with that saying, I can give these to you because I made them. <laughs> See, we usually don't think about it that way. <laughs> but the devil knew what he was saying. And, and Jesus is going to argue with him. He's going to the core of the thing when we get around to his answer. But here we are. He says... They're under my control. They are obedient to me. If I want to give them to you, I can do that. And you know, later on in John, Jesus says something that we can kind of put with this. In John 12, he said, the prince of this world. So he even gives him the title. <laughs> he's, he's the head of all those kingdoms. Now, Jesus, of course, is the real owner of this world. <laughs> so, no matter what's happening in this world, no creature owns this world. When, when Jesus told Adam, you have dominion over everything. This is your world. The animals, everything will be under your dominion. Jesus did not say, you are now the owner. He didn't say that. He said, you're the head of everything under me. <laughs> I own the world. <laughs> you're the steward. You're the, the, the head of humanity. So, that was still happening. Satan did not become the owner when Adam sold out. He just became the new head under Jesus. <laughs> and he hated it. And that's what he's working on here with Jesus. He's trying to get Jesus to twist that around now that he's a human and say, since these are my kingdoms, I'll just give them to you. And we get around to why he said it that way. All right. So now then, he said, I will give you a gift. 
But since Jesus knew the whole Bible, maybe he went back to Psalm 2. There's an interesting little scripture that would have flashed in his mind since he knew all the Bible. Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. My king, that's Jesus. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. See? We're back to the baptism. Verse 8. Ask of me, your Father in heaven. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. <laughs> and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So when the devil says, I will give them to you, Jesus knows the second psalm and says, you know, I don't need them from you. My father's going to give them to me. <laughs> Not them. He's going to give me the kingdom. The kingdom. And so Satan has done something here that I try to warn people about. Satan offered him a shortcut. I'm talking to a minister right now, a Seventh-day Adventist minister, and I'm trying to show him how shortcuts work. I think he's listening because in his particular church, they never say Seventh-day Adventist. They say Adventist. And I told him about shortcuts, pagan thought forms, and how they mess you all up because you're not getting the whole story with shortcuts. And I mentioned Seventh-day Adventist is what God said. The shortcut is Adventist. And you know what? I looked at one of his recent newsletters, and it doesn't say... Adventist anymore. It says Seventh Day Adventist Community Church. <laughs> Praise the Lord! Somebody's listening. <laughs> yeah, all those little things are important. We as the people need to get back to the way God said it, not the way it's evolved. We don't need to be evolutionists. <laughs> So anyhow, the devil here is trying to with Jesus. He's going to give him a shortcut. He doesn't have to die. You see, if the Father does it his way, you have to die. I'm telling you, you don't have to do it. <laughs> but he made a bad mistake when he did that because what he was saying, and it was out in the open, take it from me instead of God. <laughs> that was a bad mistake. <laughs> Take it from me instead of God. He says all you have to do is bend down for just a moment. That's all. And I'm happy. And I give you everything. Why did he say in a moment of time? Why was it that's all he needed? And why did he show Jesus? For a moment, he showed all this glory, all this dazzling, spectacular stuff. It was just a moment. Well, there are a couple of reasons. I think the first reason was Jesus didn't stay looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Here it was, all this. And he looked for a moment, and then he turned aside from it. He saw enough to know what he had to do. Just that fast. And so, it was just for a moment. But there was another reason, I think. I, don't, I think if Jesus had not turned away from it, it still would have been just for a moment because the devil knew, I don't want him getting too good a look. <laughs> because it's worthless. <laughs> it's worthless. <laughs> 
And maybe Satan didn't want Jesus seen too much because then he would have said, oh, forget it, you know. And Satan wanted him to want it because if he went for it, and he says, okay, it's better not to die. We'll do it this way. Then Satan wouldn't be defeated because he knew it was coming. <laughs> he was trying to save himself from defeat. <laughs> he could feel it coming. <laughs> he says, I haven't been able to do anything with this man. <laughs> Jesus knew the program. It was in the Father's will to give him the kingdom. He didn't need any of this. It was going to come to him by unutterable agony. Shame, suffering, death. He knew all that. And yet he's steadily marching towards it. He's living through it. Death, a shameful, horrible death, criminal death, infinite cost. You know, Satan, when he was giving Jesus this test, this temptation, even he did not understand how big the test really was. Because he had no way of knowing the agony that God can go through. Because Jesus did not suffer just as a man. Being God added an infinite capacity for suffering no one will ever know about. Yeah. And the devil couldn't understand it. He, did, he couldn't look into that. No equipment for it. But Jesus did. And so Satan had no idea how hard this temptation, this test would be for Jesus if he were to think about it and work it out in his mind what this all means. But of course Jesus didn't because he was happy to just simply stay in the will of his Father. See? He didn't have to go through all that. The simplicity of his life is just a marvel to try to understand. So, let's go to verse 10. Oh, I, I lost Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew. Verse 10. He has looked for a moment, turned away. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hand, fight me. Now I want you to understand how Jesus said this. He was very quiet. He was very calm. He was not throwing out a slur. He was not justifying himself. He wasn't doing anything. He just quietly said, Get thee hence, Satan. And we'll see what the power was in that. For it is written... Uh-oh. <laughs> Here comes the sword again. It is written... Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus is not entering a debate here. He's not going to discuss anything. The only thing he's doing after the victory of that second temptation is to speak with authority. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> now, Jesus is not going to sit there and say, if you wish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He says it with absolute 
absolute authority knowing when he says something now to Satan, Satan is going to obey because he has no choices. <laughs> Get the hands. Oh, Satan has said, show me that you're the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, come on, prove it. Well, here it is. Leave. <laughs> ah, what can you do about it? Nothing. <laughs> Deserve ages. I can't pass this by. Divinity. This is uh, 130. It says, Divinity flashed through suffering humanity. Remember, Jesus is dying. He can hardly lift his head. These are not two mighty warriors. Jesus is laying there dying. Weak. Divinity flashed through humanity. That one sentence is enough for all these people that say Jesus left his divinity in heaven and he just did it like a man. No. He could have never have survived with just humanity. He had to be both divine and human together to show us how it works. So divinity flashes forth. And there's a reason that she does not say in Desire of Ages. She had to leave it out of this book because the public's going to read it. There are things we alone know. The public knows nothing about these things. But if the only books you read are the books that go to the public, you're in trouble. Yes, you better start reading our books. <laughs> I'll fill you in on what she said. But first it says, divinity flashed through suffering humanity. Now, Get it in your mind what's happening. Jesus is dying. He took a one week of glimpse of that and said, No. Satan. Get the hands. Next sentence. Satan had no power to resist the command. <laughs> No power to resist the command. Rising with humiliation and rage, he was forced to withdraw from the presence of the world's Redeemer. <laughs> oh, oh, if you never heard about the power of Christianity before, get it! <laughs> Here's the power of it! Jesus tells Satan to do something and he has to do it no matter how he feels about it or what he wants to do. <laughs> now, I want to tell you, nothing has changed since that day. And the devil knows it. He has to obey when Jesus talks to him. It's only silly humans that think, Oh, what can we do with Satan? <laughs> Don't you know he's a conquered foe? Yeah. He's a, a thousand times stronger than us as mere humans, but we're not mere humans. We have Jesus in us. And that's something he can't do anything about. You see, that's the problem of trying to fight the battles by yourself. You can't do it. But Jesus can, and the devil knows it. <laughs> you see, we have been focusing on the wrong place in our struggle in salvation. We need to remember the plan of salvation is Jesus' plan. It's His power. It's His ability. It's His desire. You know, a long time ago when I had meetings on the road and used to travel around, I used to tell people in one of the meetings, maybe it's like this. You see this great big train coming down the track. Now, I used to live right next door to the trains. We heard them every night. <laughs> and every now and then we go down to look at them, and those are big things. I mean, 
you stand there and you look at this monster piece of metal coming by, and you know, don't get in front of that. <laughs> don't do it. There was a little boy in our neighborhood who did. It took his arm right off. Yeah. They're mighty, mighty things, those trains. So, here comes a train down the track. You don't have to tell too many people, don't stand in front of it. <laughs> no. All that power. But tell you what, why don't you get on the train? And now all that power is working for you, but it only works for you if you go where it's going. <laughs> That's what it is of Christianity. All the power that none of us will ever understand. An infinity of power is going somewhere. And we're going to go there too if we get on and go with it. <laughs> Nothing can stop us. What actually compelled the devil to leave? What do you think? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, the grass out there, does it obey God? You ever seen a blade of grass not obey God? <laughs> no. What about the cockroaches out there? Do they obey God? Yeah, they obey God. The trees? The wind? The oceans? All of nature obeys God. All the animals obey God. Everything on this planet obeys God except man. Does that include Christians? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Do you see how horrible that is? If a person says, I'm a Christian. I've left all that mess of sin. Now I'm like the trees and the grass and the animals and the wind. I obey God. Well, we will if we believe it. <laughs> You know what we believe in if we don't obey God? We're believing in sin. Now, that's a terrible thing to believe in. The devil left because Jesus put him in the ranks of the trees. And the <laughs> no choice. No choice. You're going to obey me from now on. When I tell you to do something, that's it. Because Satan was lost. He had no moral abilities anymore. He was sealed as a lost being forever. So there's no reason to treat him, you know, like, here's a choice. No, it doesn't make any difference. He's gone. No choice. See? Morality only works with beings who have an ability to choose something. <laughs> We all have the choice. All the lost people out there who have not rejected Jesus because they don't know, they still have a choice. But Satan rejected Jesus looking at him face to face and knew what he was doing. So Jesus says, I'm not talking to you anymore as a person who can be saved. You're past it. I'm sorry. And we know that Jesus cried when he told you Satan that the first time. No. When I tell you to do something, that's what I mean. That's it. <laughs> you know what? I'm tempted to get into a discussion of justice. I'm not going to do it, but just think of this. The world out there that professes to be Christians, all they talk about is mercy. Well, that's not God. He's not just mercy. He's also justice. And justice demands that His universe be cleaned up so everybody can live in it without wondering who's going to do it next. In all the churches that teach the immortality of the soul, what they're teaching is God isn't strong enough to get rid of sin. He's got to keep it forever. 
That's horrible. It's a blasphemy. Sunday keeping ministers, I didn't mean to say the word, but when they're out there preaching every week, they are, they are teaching blasphemy and they don't know it. Satan had a choice to rebel, yes. But once he was sealed that way, that was the end of it. Yeah. All right. Jesus did not challenge him. He gave him a command. I hesitate to tell you this because it's hard to understand it without getting it wrong. But I'm going to say it anyhow. Jesus, at this point of dealing with Lucifer, Satan, the, the slanderer, when he said, Satan, get the hand. Remember, the Spirit of Prophecy says divinity had just flashed forth. Satan had insulted God by saying, God, I want you out of this world. And I'm going to arrange it that way by you bowing down once by saying, I am superior to you for one moment. Yeah. He knew who Jesus was in eternity. He says, if I can get him to bow to me just one time, I will have fulfilled Isaiah 14. I will be like God. I have even God bowing down to me. One time. <laughs> you see where he was headed? <laughs> and so Jesus was, in, in effect, he was dying, but he was indignant. So this blasphemous creature is insulting the Godhead. No. No more. Get the hands. <laughs> you see, God has a place where even He has to stop and say, No more. There are people who think God's patience never ends. That's not true. There's a place where God's patience ends because He knows it won't do any more good. Ellen White said a sentence that just absolutely made me shake when I read, and it still gets to me because I know I, I have the ability to do that very thing. She says, our people talk about the God of love, the God of love, and, and, and God loves too much to not save me. And she says, and our, our people presume too much upon the love of God. Now, I have always had that particular tendency. You know, David was that way. He could only see the love of God. He got himself in trouble. Well, I can say I've gotten myself in trouble too, but we need to be very careful not to presume upon the love of God because he also has to clean up his universe. He cannot have unsaved sinners going on forever. They're going to create a problem. We must be redeemed by Jesus so that we become like Him in character. Then it's okay. I'm discussing with a minister right now what Bible faith is. Now, he thinks he knows all about it, but the way I'm approaching it is through the concept of spiritualism. Spiritualism is nothing more than the plan of Satan to get everybody lost. And it's a lot more than seances. <laughs> the foundation of spiritualism, hold on to your seat, is self-gratification. Yeah. Self-indulgence. That is spiritualism. Christianity is self-denial for the sake of others. Yeah. So you're either living in this world or you're living in that world. And let's face it, the old man is still there trying to say, oh, I like that, or oh, I want that, or oh, I'm going to do this, and never even ask God what he wants. We have to fight that. We, we, we have to get over it. 
We have to have victory over that. No more insults, slanderer. Get the hands. And he had to leave. <laughs> he had to leave. Oh, gritting his teeth and gnashing the whole way. But there's nothing more he could say. He had to leave. <laughs> Do you know? Maybe it's close by here. Yes, yes. Same page. I want to read this to you and you, don't you ever forget it. You go home and underline it. And you put marks all around it and say, I want to believe this. I must believe it. It's true. Here comes the sentence. So, we may resist temptation and force Jesus, uh, so force Satan to depart from us. Did you know you can force Satan to leave? <laughs> there it is. Now you know. Jesus said, Satan, get the hands. We have the same power. Because Jesus' divinity is with us and He's already conquered Satan. It's not a big deal. That's already done. We just have to tell Him to leave. He was attempting to place himself above Jesus because Jesus already owned the world and Satan knew that. He was trying to trick him. So Jesus has now demonstrated something. Jesus will not gain this world by giving homage to Satan. He will gain it by the eviction of Satan. <laughs> All he has to do is tell him, leave. <laughs> and Satan knows that now. Jesus doesn't have to do another thing. He has been victorious over Satan. He's conquered him. That victory is our victory. That's what Ellen White just said here. You better get used to saying it. Get the hint, Satan. And, and don't start getting presumptuous and think you're doing it. <laughs> it's the power of Jesus that makes him leave. You remember what happened in the New Testament when some people tried to use the power of Jesus? Yeah. The devil jumped all over them. The, the demons just tore them up. They said, well, now, we know Paul. We know, we know Jesus. But who are you? <laughs> <laughs> don't play games it is written but you know we haven't talked about something here Satan left out something again in the way he said it he said I'll give you all of this just bow down one time just worship me one, one little moment I'm happy he left out something and Jesus put it back Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and, and the part he left out, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, the devil teaches you can worship without service. You can sit in that pew every week. You can go to the potlucks afterwards. You can... Even give big money. But it doesn't mean anything if you're not serving God in His cause to win souls. You cannot worship without service. How many of our people have been trapped into thinking they can do that? Just go to church once a week, listen to the minister's sermon, and that's it. I'm a Christian. Who said so? Satan lied. And the second Adam would not be deceived. The issue was not the kingdoms. 
The issue was the kingdom that God the Father would give him. Now, it's an interesting thing to me. The scholars have wrestled with this word kingdoms, and there are books written on it. How in the Bible the word kingdom and kingdoms is used. Ellen White never misses. Never. I have never found her on the, any level to ever miss an important point. She never misses. Greek, Hebrew, she didn't know either one of those. She never misses. The slightest little nuance of the Greek or the Hebrew, she's got it. Now, she didn't study it. She didn't work it out scientifically. She didn't come it as a scholar. The Lord just showed her the truth, and that's what she wrote. And it's always there. I'll show it to you here in the thought of ages in our subject today. Page 129, it says, When Satan declared to Christ, The kingdom and the glory of the world are delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will give it. Did you notice the word she used? She said kingdom. She changed it to the real. She didn't say kingdoms. You see this more clearly in the book of Revelation. Where it talks about kingdoms and then kingdom. There's two different words there. But Ellen White says it correctly here. On the top of the page, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Daniel 4.17. Not kingdoms. Kingdom. And so Ellen White, every time, if you haven't already arrived at the point where you trust the spirit of prophecy, I invite you to test the spirit of prophecy any way you know how and find out she never trips. <laughs> this is the word of God to us. We have something here no one outside the remnant people can understand. Yeah. There's a power here we are denying when we don't read it. Every Adventist in the world has books. They're sitting on their shelves. And I can tell how long they've been sitting there by rubbing my finger on the top. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask a minister this week, when's the last time he read Great Controversy? I'm going to ask him. Now, when he says, well, I don't know. I'm going to take him to a page and read him something he's never heard of before in the great controversy, and then I'm going to ask him, how come you don't know this? How are your people ever going to know if you don't know it and you don't tell them? They're not going to read it. I can guarantee it. Somebody has to tell them. <laughs> it's on spiritualism. Read that chapter. All right. One kingdom by the cross. No other way. One kingdom. Jesus did not compare the proposal of Satan with what his father said. He never went through that because Satan was a blasphemer right there and he could see it. He commanded him to depart. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Oh, what a highlight in the Bible. Oh, Jesus, quietly. No fuss, no problem, no question, nothing. Just leave. You just insulted the Godhead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Leave. So he triumphed in his person. He triumphed in his work. Unswerving loyalty. He was invulnerable. Do you like that word? Invulnerable to attack. Do you know in that same book, Desire of Ages, that's what she says to us. We are invulnerable to the attacks of Satan. Jesus means to hold us as a fortress. We need to see these statements and not only underline them, you know what I do? Because I know I forget things. I sit down at my computer and 
and I print them out, and I print them out in fancy pages, and I print them out in plain pages, and I print them out in color, and I print them out in black and white. <laughs> and I look at them, and I look at them, and I say, that's the truth. I must believe that. My body says, don't believe that. My mind says, don't believe that. My flesh says, don't believe that. But my spirit says, that's the truth. <laughs> and I go after it until I know that belongs to me. That's mine. We need to have some method in the way we approach things. Just because you read something once doesn't mean you know it. <laughs> Just because you even memorize it doesn't mean you know it. You don't have it until it's by heart. Now, that's different than in your brain. I know it by heart. <laughs> he completely broke the power of the enemy. Now, if you didn't know that before today, you need to know it right now. There's nothing more to talk about. Jesus completely, forever broke Satan. All right, I'm going to do some things here. I'm glad I have a little bit of extra time. I wrote some things down this morning that I, I, I hoped I would be able to talk about a little bit. First of all, I want to remind you that the order that Satan approached Jesus was as an animal. Bread, trust, and worship. Now, if you read the answers that Jesus gave to those, they're all in Deuteronomy. And if you read the way the order is in the Bible they're opposite from what Satan used them. In Deuteronomy 6.13, the first answer was worship. Now, the, that's the third temptation. But the first answer in the Bible is in Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. So God does not begin with man as an animal. He begins with him as a worshiping, intelligent being. Then the next one is Deuteronomy 6, 16. That one is about trust. And then the third one is about bread. In uh, Deuteronomy 8, verse 13. Excuse me, verse 3. Verse 3. So it's the opposite. God says, I receive you... In your lost condition, by receiving Jesus, the first thing we talk about is worship. That's it. That's how God views us. The opposite of the way the devil does. Now, you will notice that when Jesus dealt with Satan, he only used one scripture. <laughs> he didn't give him a Bible study. In the whole Bible, Jesus, that one. <laughs> And you know how perfect the answer was because Satan, who's a big mouth, never said another word. <laughs> it's utter silence. Jesus finished him on the point with one scripture. <laughs> That's tremendous. Now, why was Satan trying so hard with Jesus? Why was he why was he willing to give him the whole world? Because Jesus was worth more to Satan than the whole world was. He had everything. Centuries and centuries of the devil's work building that empire, building that king, building those riches, building this building this thing against God. I mean, all that work he went through, the entire planet in all of its history, Jesus was worth more to him than all of that. <laughs> well, you say, well, sure, <laughs> Jesus. But I want to remind you of something that Jesus himself said. Mark, the eighth chapter. 
that one human is worth more than the whole world. You are worth more than the whole world to God. You get that? Satan knew the perfect man was worth it. But God says, you are worth it to me. What did Jesus say? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? If he gained the whole world, what does he got? If he loses his soul, the man is worth more than the world. You might need a statement for this insult and you'll have a hard time finding it unless you know where to look because it's only list written four times in the whole library. I'll give you the one place you can find it very quickly. The Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 286. One SM 286. It's also in Confrontation, but I don't know how many people have that one. It's a nice little book. All right. Another thing I would like you to notice that some of the powerful Sunday-keeping pre preachers of long time ago knew, but the ones today don't seem to know, that when Jesus said, man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, he put himself under law. See, the preachers want to say just grace. That is not what Jesus did. He would not have defeated the devil just saying, I'm under grace. He said, every word of God. He put himself under law, but he also, in quoting Deuteronomy, put himself under Deuteronomy. That, to him, was the word of God. Now, the next time you tell a per have a person tell you they don't believe in the Old Testament, you better ask him a couple questions. How come Jesus believed in it? He put himself under it and he quoted Deuteronomy to defeat the devil. <laughs> the sacred scriptures have divine authority and Jesus used the scripture that met the, the problem. All right, one other point we might talk about here. In Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 1, we know that Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. It says He went out there full of the Spirit. He was completely sanctified. He was pure he was holy. He went out into that wilderness full of the Spirit. Now, verse 14 is different. It tells us how he came out. And it uses a different word. <laughs> it says, now he came out in the power. See, you can be full of the Holy Spirit and still not have the power. Jesus was full of the Spirit. But after he'd been victorious over Satan and tested, now he has the power. What power is it? It is a conscious power that comes to a person that knows, I've had victory over that. God has given me grace and victory. I don't have a problem with that now. I have the victory. It's been settled. It's been decided. God has taken me through it. And I have the consciousness now that in Jesus Christ, by His grace, I walk through that. I have power now. <laughs> See? That's why Jesus could say to the devil, 
get the hint. She had the power now. Desire of Ages says we have the same power to force him to leave, but not until we're tested. <laughs> See? Because if we fail test after test after test, there's no power. Yeah. We can't play games with God. He says he's got the power for us. Let's get it. But you don't get it just by saying, I want it. <laughs> You've got to be tested. You know how it goes. Lord, give me patience and hurry up. <laughs> no. No. There's only one way you get the power. That's through personal conflict. God cannot just give it to you and lay it on you and say, here it is, it's a gift. We get it through conflict. Then we know how to use it. We know we have it. And so, I think Satan was a little bit happy to leave after he thought about it. Yeah, he, he, he left infuriated and humiliated and in a rage. But then after he got away, he probably thought, oh, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> He had exhausted himself. There was no place else to go. There was nothing else he could do. He was through anyhow. <laughs> yeah. He was defeated and he was crushed. And he has never recovered. Okay? He has never recovered. He's never going to. What happens when you see demons in front of Jesus in the New Testament? Does he ever debate with them? Ever have any discussions? Does he ask them, would you please? <laughs> no, whenever he talks to a demon, it's to tell them to do something. And that's what they have to do. That's what they have to do. I don't think that any demon has any problem knowing Jesus is God. <laughs> oh, Holy One. Please don't let us just go out there. Let us go into the swine. It says, go. One word, go. It was Jews who were taking care of those swine. Now, what were they doing taking care of swine? <laughs> So Jesus said, you know, you people, there goes your living. <laughs> oh. What they do with the swine? How many of those devils were there? Jesus asked them first. He said, what's your name? He wanted the apostles to know what was happening. What's your name? Uh, Legion. We're many. Not just one devil here, not two, two demons, uh, no, uh, legion. Two thousand demons. Now, I would call that first grade possession. <laughs> yeah, two thousand demons. And they said, please, don't just let us go over there. The swine, please. Go. And immediately they took all those swine and ran them over the edge of something and killed them all. That's what devils do. Give them a chance, that's what they're going to do. And so afterwards, the devil's gone. The devil's, the devil's. Everybody's gone except the angels. Yeah, they've been watching this whole thing. They saw the divinity flash forth. They knew. <laughs> oh, oh, he went too far. <laughs> There's the indignity of God. And Jesus is laying there. Just So they come to him. And the angels bring him food. 
And they start ministering to him. In Gethsemane, we see a little bit more where Gabriel comes and lifted Jesus' head off of the ground, that cold, wet ground. He, he, he was gone. And Gabriel lifted his head up and gave him some food. This must have happened here with the angels. Jesus is at the end of what humanity can do and they start bringing him back. He gets a little bit stronger. He begins to recover. And then he gets up and his first thought, humans need to be saved. He had that to do his work. But you know, this little glimpse of these angels, always there ready to minister, and they wanted to, but they were held back. You don't find angels helping him a lot of times in the New Testament. They wanted to. Because his path is a lonely path. He must do it by himself. No help. This is between him and the Father to show what humans can do connected to God. The angels, the book of Hebrews, it says, are ministers to us. They're in this room right now. The angels. And they're sent here to minister to us. So, they love to minister to Jesus. They love to minister to us because He loves us. <laughs> they love us too. <laughs> At first, they weren't sure why He loves us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they couldn't figure it out. So, what is it? <laughs> why is God willing to pay this kind of a price for them? <laughs> But the Father and Jesus love us with a love we don't understand. And so they minister to us, these tall beings. And what a shame, all the things they have to see and hear and write down. Uh, I hesitate to talk about it because of the tears I've shed over it. They have written it all down. And yet, the Father says, I want you to be with me. And Jesus is paid. You know, Peter was trying to understand some of this, and he still wasn't getting it. He hadn't been converted yet. <laughs> We've been with Jesus for three years, and I wasn't converted. <laughs> Talking to him, listening to him, I still wasn't getting it. And finally, that last night, <laughs> he whacked off an ear. <laughs> he meant to get the head, but all he got was, was an ear. <laughs> he was a bad aim. <laughs> he didn't know about swords. Fishermen don't know how to sing those things. <laughs> and so Jesus, oh, no, no, don't do that. He said, put it away. You live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. <laughs> and so Peter put it away. And Jesus said, Peter, don't you know? There's thousands of angels all around here. And all I need to say is one little word, and they're all here, and these are all dead men. <laughs> yeah, those angels were ready. So, Come on, <laughs> let's take care of this. <laughs> They can't treat our commander this way. Jesus said, no. No. This I do by myself. With the power the Father gives me to handle it. And so as we finish the temptations today, we'll move on now. Let's remember that when we become abandoned to His Lordship, His triumph is our triumph. Yeah. The Father doesn't hold anything back. So what Jesus did, He gives to you. 
the devil is a conquered foe in your life. Abide in us. John 14. He who keeps my word abides with us. We will abide with him. The Father and I, we will come to you. These legions of fallen angels did not die with the pigs. No, it is almost as if they wished to inhabit souls. Yeah. You know how they do that? They do it. They do it. Alan White says, when we do not resist temptation, we are inviting Satan to come to us. You see, this is not a game like the Roman Catholics teach. Oh, go ahead and move through life. You're going to fall. You're going to do that. Just stay confessed up. Just be sure to remember to confess. Then you're okay again. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not being confessed up. Christianity is not doing it. <laughs> I mean, even back at the time of Samuel, that's what they were told. It is better to obey than to have to offer a sacrifice for your sin. <laughs> if you obey, no sacrifice is necessary. <laughs> One last thing then. The Old Testament uses the bullock as a symbol. God says to each of us, you be that bullock who is between the altar and the plow. What's that mean? Between the altar and the plow. It doesn't mean he was standing between. It means that bullock was ready to either be sacrificed or to pull the plow and work. God's choice. That's who we're supposed to be. Here I am, Lord. What do you want me to be? A sacrifice or get out and work? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us without witness. Jesus has shown us the truth. Jesus is the truth. Help us to understand that in these temptations, it wasn't just Jesus that was victorious. All eternity is victorious. The angels are victorious that never fell. And all of us here are victorious. Help us to understand that we don't fight this warfare in our strength. We are developing a character because we believe and trust. And now the song can mean something to us. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Oh Lord, help us to stop listening to lies. And let us receive your word, every word, and let us live by them. And let us enter into that joy that only the obedient will ever know, as it says in Steps of Christ, the bliss that only the obedient can know. Let us not struggle to be obedient. Let us just believe. Let us know that in Jesus we have all the victory we need. We thank you in his holy name. Amen.